My sister's creepy boyfriend is obsessed with my 13-year-old son. I, F38, am a single mother, living on a waitress salary. Times are tough right now, and due to unforeseen circumstances, I've had to move in with my sister for the past couple months. It's not an ideal situation, but I'm doing my best. I have an ex-husband, M40, who is emotionally abusive, hence the divorce. We share custody of my incredible son, let's call him Roman, 13, who has been so understanding of our financial situation, even at his age. I love him more than I love myself. He is kind and intelligent. He stole my ex-husband's face, unfortunately, so he's beautiful. Every mama will say their son is beautiful, but my kid really is stunningly gorgeous. The amount of adults my age and older who have given him the creepy and unwarranted he's going to be a heartbreaker in a few years comments would alarm you. He has ADHD, but maintains decent grades. He plays a sport and is good at it. He's got lots of friends who he visits often, and vice versa. Despite the changes in our living situation, he is thriving, and I'd do anything to keep that up. My sister, let's call her Sarah, 42, and her boyfriend, let's call him David, 44, are well off and live in a massive house. My sister was happy to take me in, but her boyfriend David, not so much, which I completely understand. I offered to pay rent, but my sister won't have any of it, so I do chores around the house and cook as often as my work schedule will let me. I never saw much of David anyway, he was often at the bar with his friends, or working, or locked in his room playing video games. When we did see each other, he acted like I didn't exist. My son Roman was staying with his dad for a while as I was figuring things out, and I was worried about David's attitude once my son moved in with us. I talked to David and promised him that Roman would be respectful and well-behaved, but he was weird about it and shrugged me off. Then David met Roman. David is absolutely fascinated with my kid. His disposition changed so quickly that it gave me whiplash. Suddenly, he stopped locking himself in his room and has decided to spend time with us, well, mostly my son. He helps Roman with his homework. He watches all of Roman's favorite shows so that they can talk about them together. He buys him food and gifts. My sister Sarah is over the moon, she's been telling me about how us moving in has been the best thing for their relationship, because David is happier now. I thought it was sweet at first. But in the back of my head, I think something more nefarious could be going on. To paint a clearer picture, I've noted some other changes I've noticed that I can't decide whether they're innocent or not. David texts my son often, which wouldn't be weird, except he does it while he's at school. The texts themselves aren't weird at all, but David lightly scolds him for not replying sometimes. Before my son moved in, David was rarely ever home during the afternoon slash evenings. He'd stay out after work and go drinking with his buddies until late in the night, a habit he's had for years, according to my sister. Now, he's home all the time. He gets home before Roman gets off the bus, around 3.15 p.m. if he's not at practice, and stays home all day even offering to babysit while I'm working through the evening. He still drinks, just in the house. Last Wednesday, I woke up to use the bathroom during the middle of the night. To get to the bathroom, you have to pass by my son's room. I was surprised to see that the door was closed all the way, since Roman always likes it open because his room gets hot at night. Also, he has been staying up late texting his friends lately, which has caused him to sleep through his alarm and miss the bus some days. So that night, I opened the door to let the air in and make sure he was asleep, and there was David. Standing by Roman's bed. In the dark. He stated that he was looking for his cell phone, but I saw him jump with anxiety when I opened the door. He left quickly, muttering something about how it might be in the kitchen. Why would his phone be in my son's room? And why was the door closed? David offers to drive my son everywhere he needs to go. Only him. School, if he misses the bus, practice, his friends' houses. This is the same man who wouldn't lift a finger for me until my son moved in. It's been incredibly helpful since I'm not home often, but a part of me wonders if he's doing it for the wrong reasons. I caught David doing Roman's laundry, resulting in a few articles of clothing going missing. 
This one irritated me because I make my son do his own laundry. I asked him not do this, but his excuse is that he is trying to save water. I don't know how to fight him on this since it's his house. I am terrified to bring this up to my sister. Am I reading into things too much? Am I silly for worrying that he might have ulterior motives? If I tell my sister and she gets angry and there's nothing going on, she'll kick us out and we'll be homeless. Update 1. Hi all. First, I want to thank you all for your responses and suggestions. I am so overwhelmed by the replies and was unable to read them all, but I'm glad, and terrified, to see that I'm not going crazy, that there is something wrong. I also want to thank those who shared their experiences with being groomed slash sexually assaulted, as it opened my eyes to a lot of things. Second, I'd like to clarify a few things. I did not let my child in David's car after the bedroom incident. I would never do that. After this occurrence, tied with the laundry situation, I began to take note of David's behavior, which was when I started putting the pieces together. I came to Reddit shortly after, and here we are, unfortunately. Third, I'd like to address a couple questions I've seen. David is not on any sex offender registry. By saving water, David meant that he combines loads of laundry, meaning that he'll do his laundry and Roman's laundry in the same load. The laundry that I've seen go missing are mostly socks, which is typical, even when Roman was doing his own laundry. But then, Roman told me that he was missing a couple shirts and a pair of underwear. That alarmed me, since this only happened once David started doing his laundry. Massive red flag. The texts between really are innocent, David asking him what he wants for dinner, what time he should pick him up, discussing shows they've been watching. But based on his other behavior, it's clearly a grooming tactic and I'll be sure that it stops immediately. No way in hell should he be texting my kid at school. The bedroom situation, in clearer detail. I peeked in to make sure that Roman was asleep, and David was at the foot of his bed. The room was of course pitch black, and I was groggy as hell, so I didn't even register that it was him until he pushed past me to leave. I checked on my son afterwards. He was still asleep, and the blankets were fully over him. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but maybe I'd just intervened at the right moment. I made sure his door was open, and I left my door open as well so I could listen for any footsteps. I could not sleep after that happened. It wasn't sitting right with me. None of these are excuses. Like I said, eyes are wide open now. Fourth, I'll discuss everything with my son tonight, once I get off work. A lot of you said it was a good idea, and I was already planning on doing it. He has not been acting strange in any way and is his usual happy self, but that doesn't mean that David hasn't done anything yet. That reality is terrifying to me, and I pray that's not the case. I pretty much have a clear idea on what to say to him, but I am not sure if I should explicitly tell him that I found David in his room, or that he might be stealing his clothing. Any suggestions on how to go about this conversation are welcome. Fifth, I fully plan to confront David and talk to my sister Sarah about this. I am not a doormat, and I will do anything to keep my son safe. David is on a church retreat and thankfully has not been home for a few days. I've decided to speak with my sister first, in case David twists my words or manipulates her into believing that nothing is wrong. And once he returns, I'll confront him based on how my sister reacts. Any other suggestions on how to go about it are welcome as well. Sixth, I've read your suggestions about setting up cameras, checking for cameras, drug testing my son, and finding his missing articles of clothing. I plan on buying cameras and drug testing him once we have a conversation. I did look for cameras and found nothing, but I'll look again. I am terrified of what I might see if I end up finding Roman's missing clothing, but I know it's just a reality that I have to face, that people can be so disgustingly vile to a child. Lastly, I know I need to get out of this house. I know that. I'm working on it. If I could pack everything up tonight and do it, I would. I'd send him to live with my ex-husband, but he's abusive toward my son and me, more so toward me, but still. I've considered your suggestions about looking into homeless shelters, and I'm leaning toward making arrangements for that after I confront David. 
I'm a good mom, but I know I'm not the best mom. This past week has been hell. I should have intervened earlier. I regret that. Thank you for listening. I'll update once I follow through with my plans. Update 2. In the past four days, I spoke with my sister Sarah, her boyfriend David, and my son Roman, all separately. One went well, two didn't. I have a lot to get off my chest, so this might be long. There's a TLDR at the bottom. My first conversation was with my son, which occurred the night I posted my first update. In fear of this post getting removed like my first one, I'll have to censor myself, but I think you'll understand what I'm referring to when I say that I asked my son the serious and explicit questions. Roman adamantly denied that David ever did anything to him. He seemed surprised that I asked. He said he would have told me if he had. I believe him. I know he could be lying, but I'm trying to take his word for it. My son and I have a very open and transparent relationship. The first time my ex-husband ever verbally abused him, he came straight to me and told me about it. My guard is up, but I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like you all advised me, I didn't bring up the bedroom or laundry situation. But I was honest with him and told him that David's behavior toward him was inappropriate. We had a talk about boundaries, saying no, consent, etc. I drilled into him that David is not to drive him anywhere, text him anymore, and be around him alone under any circumstances. I also explained what grooming is, and that it's what David has been doing to him. He said he knew about it through a school assembly. Then, he said something that broke my heart. He apologized for letting David treat him that way, that he shouldn't have fell for it, his exact words. I assured him that none of it was his fault. I want to make it clear that David is not preying on him because of how he looks or how he acts, he is doing it because he is a predator and they prey on the vulnerable. Honestly, I could tell that the conversation had left him a little shell-shocked. To know that the person you liked and trusted isn't who you thought he was would leave any kid rattled. For the entire rest of the night, he followed me around like a lost puppy. It did break my heart a little, to see him like that, but I don't want him to feel a false sense of security around David, so I have no regrets about it. Sarah was next. I knew it would turn into an argument before the conversation even began. It's always been that way with her. My sister is nice, but not kind. She'll take you in off the street, but then throw it back in your face if you cross her. So I knew what I was getting into, but I had to do it not only for my kid's sake, but for hers. This is not a man I want her to be with, have children with, nor do I want him in our family. I told her that I was uncomfortable with the way David acts around Roman, and that I think it's a lot deeper than what he portrays it to be. I mentioned that I didn't like the gift-giving and the constant texting, and I brought up the bedroom and laundry incidents. Like I predicted, she was more offended that I was accusing her boyfriend of grooming my son. She didn't see how that was proof of anything. Do you know how many socks and pairs of underwear I've lost while doing laundry? It's probably stuck somewhere in the dryer. The more I expressed my concerns, the more defensive she got. She thinks I'm manic, essentially. She said that as soon as things get good for me, roof over my head, food in the fridge, a steady job, I intentionally screw it up because deep down I don't think I deserve happiness. That she tries to help me every time, but I end up stabbing her in the back, like I am right now. So, she doesn't believe me. That's her prerogative, fine. I told her that I won't be staying at her house much longer, and that I don't want David around my kid anymore that we'll be keeping to ourselves for the rest of my short time here. She's letting me stay, surprisingly, but she said she's glad to see me go. She swore up and down that David would never hurt Roman, and that she was sad to see their relationship ruined over an accusation with no real basis. That I shouldn't let my self-destructive behavior and my bipolar paranoia get in the way of other people's happiness. And that I'd better not accuse her boyfriend of being a predator anymore. Essentially, she kept shifting the blame onto me, so I ended it there. Oh, and she told me that she wants reimbursement for things like clothing and grocery shopping, because apparently we are draining her wallet with buying so much food, yes, an 8th grader going through a gross spurt eats a lot. Shocker. 
but I apologized and said I'd buy his and my groceries from now on. David came back from his church retreat Friday morning, which is when I confronted him. I was very upset, so I didn't go easy on him. He was thrown off by my hostility, but once he understood what I was implying, his demeanor shifted. Sit down, sit down, let's talk about it, he kept saying, except he was the one who was nervous and looked like he was on the brink of a panic attack. I kept my composure. I asked him why he was in my son's room in the middle of the night with the door shut. He gave me the same excuse that he was looking for his cell phone. I asked him why he couldn't have gone for it in the morning. He said that he set the alarm to 5 a.m. for work and that he didn't want it to go off with my son in the room and wake him up. I asked him why he was standing over my son's bed. He admitted that he was trying to wake him up and ask him if he'd seen his phone. Did he not just say that he didn't want the alarm to wake him up? I asked him what on earth would compel him to think it is okay to wake up my child in the middle of the night to help him look for a cell phone. He said he wasn't thinking straight and that he was sorry. I asked him about the missing laundry as well. He adamantly denied what I was implying. He said that his and my sister's clothing get lost in the laundry all the time. That he would help me find my son's missing clothing all while apologizing profusely. I'll admit, I was thrown off by how apologetic he was, and it made me a little soft. I thanked him for letting us stay in his house, and I apologized for not setting boundaries earlier, but I told him that from now on, I didn't feel comfortable with him being around my son. No more driving him places, buying him gifts, texting him, helping him with homework, doing his laundry, etc. I essentially told him that he is no longer allowed to be alone with my son or touch his things under any circumstances. He broke down in tears. He was hysterical. The thought of me believing that he is preying on my son made him miserable. That he'd never do that. He said, I love him like a father loves a son. When reading my original post, a lot of you believed the same thing at first. So did I. But I just don't like the way David looks at him. Yes, I see the kindness in his eyes toward my son as he helps him with homework or watches a show with him, but there is a nuance of something covetous and sinister that I can't shake off. Anyway, I told him that it's unhealthy for him to be so fixated on a child, and that he cannot depend on my kid for happiness. I told him that we'd be leaving very soon, more on that later. I didn't tell him where or when it was happening, he asked if there was anything he could do to rectify the situation. He suggested that the four of us sit down and talk about it. I declined. I reiterated that he is not allowed near my kid anymore and left it at that. A small part of me feels like I was too harsh on him overall. Maybe he was just looking for his phone. Maybe it's a coincidence that articles of clothing are missing. But he was on his knees, sobbing, like I had just pulled the rug out from underneath him. For a child, he hasn't known for that long. I don't think he was devastated that I'd accused him of being a predator, he was devastated that I revoked his access to my child. I'm not stupid. I once witnessed this man argue with my sister, brutal, verbal assaults from both sides, which ended in my sister crying. He didn't shed a tear. For my peace of mind, and yours, I have been watching Roman like a hawk. When I'm home, he's with me. When I'm not home, he's at a trusted friend's house, or again, with me. I actually took him to work with me this morning, which he wasn't thrilled about, but whatever. I made him block David's number, of course. We haven't been in the house since Friday, but as some of you suggested, I will sleep in his room at night instead of making him sleep in my room. I'll be honest, I decided to hold off on drug testing him, because I really do not think David has been drugging him. My son is naturally a heavy sleeper and has always had issues waking up for school, even before we moved into my sister's house. I checked his text messages, and from what I've seen, he's never texted David at night. He's usually up texting his friends in a group chat. Like you all suggested, I purchased a nanny cam, specifically the one where you can watch the footage on your smartphone. I wasn't expecting it to be so pricey, I ordered them on Wednesday, and they are due to arrive tonight or Monday morning. I'll put it in my son's room and review it every day. 
I'm really nervous because there's a possibility that I'll see something odious, and I don't know if I can handle that. Lots of you have voiced your concerns for my kid. From what I've seen and from what he's told me, he's doing fine. We have been staying at a motel for the weekend, now that David has returned from his church retreat. I wasn't taking any chances. $56 a night, and a little sketchy, but I don't want to complain. Again, despite the situation, his mood has been a lot better than mine has. He thinks a motel is the same as a hotel, so to him, it's like we're on a mini vacation. It's mind-blowing how kids can be so resilient, even in the most unnerving situations. The majority of you have told me to go to a women's shelter. I looked into this, and while it's an option, the closest one to where I live is more than an hour away. I don't have a car. I can take the bus, my usual mode of transportation, but that disrupts his commute to school, and my commute to work. It's still winter and freezing cold where I live, so I'd rather watch him like a hawk than live on the street and subject him to the cold weather. And I am not taking him back to my ex-husband's house. There's a reason why he left, and why I divorced him. Which brings me to some good news. I applied for public housing a long while back, and I am in the process of getting approved. They contacted me for documentation, which I submitted, and I got verified, so I think that's a good sign. I'm very fortunate, since I know waitlists can be long sometimes. I can't believe I'm holding it together so well, but I'm proud of myself. I think I'm doing everything I can. Thank you for listening. I'll update again shortly, with hopefully better news. Update 3. I have both bad news and good, really good. News. Due to the bad news, I'm not mentally doing the best right now, so I'm sorry if this is scrambled, because I don't really know where to start. I'm angry, hurt, disgusted, and as all of my emotions begin to pile upon each other, I'm beginning to spiral a bit. And before anyone begins to worry, I'll put it out there now that my son is doing okay. I guess I'll start off by saying that my son and I weren't in the house much, up until Friday of this week. We've been staying at a local motel that's decently close to his school and where I work. I am a waitress at a restaurant, and my manager knows I'm dealing with housing issues, so he's been a bit understanding with me when I call out. But when you don't work, you don't get paid, and between the lifts, takeouts, and motel costs, my wallet isn't doing so great, but I'm 100% making it work, and I have no regrets. But since we weren't at the house, things sort of escalated a bit. David's number is blocked on Roman's phone, but he found him on TikTok and Instagram on Monday night and messaged him there. Nothing explicit in the messages, just things like. Did you block my number? I really miss talking to you, is everything okay? Maybe in the future, we can talk to each other again. I'm sorry if I upset you or your mom. Are you and your mom safe? Where are you staying? Respond to me when you get a moment. I have something important to tell you. And many more like that, just him begging my son for a conversation. I was livid when my son showed me. I think what set me off the most is that I know David messaged him because he thought my kid would respond without telling me. He thinks they have some secret, private relationship right under my nose that I'm interfering with. I'm pretty sure that's why he hasn't kicked me out of his house. He's not mad, just miserable and desperate for some sort of contact. I feel like no matter how hard I pull my son away from David, he's refusing to let go. We blocked the Instagram and TikTok accounts immediately, and I screenshotted the messages, I'm trying to keep a record of everything. I asked Roman to delete his Snapchat account, just in case, but he didn't want to do that, I'm 99% sure he has a girl on there that he likes. I let that slide because he came straight to me about the other accounts, and he agreed not to add any new accounts on Snapchat or post anything that gave away our location for the time being. This entire ordeal upset my son. He broke down in tears when he came back from school the next day. That hurt a lot to see. I don't know if I expressed this, but Roman genuinely liked David, and they got along well. Maybe my kid saw him as a father figure, since he was shunned and neglected by my ex-husband. I think I underestimated the mental toll it would take on him from having to cut David off completely, and then block him when he reached out privately. 
Someone noted that I should get him into therapy soon. I plan on doing that once we are securely living on our own and I find the money for it. It's definitely a priority. David's harassment spilled over to me, too. He called me multiple times and texted me things like, Let me know when you're back so we can resolve this. Am I allowed to attend Roman's baseball game on Thursday with you? I'd like to support him. Can you please answer? I'd really love to talk, just us. I'm sorry if I gave you both the wrong impression. I didn't block his number on my phone. I figured that the more he talked, the more likely he'd continue to incriminate himself and I could use his words against him. I didn't answer a single one of his questions, but I let him know that if he contacted my kid ever again or if he showed up to his school or any events that I'd go straight to the police. And that's not an empty threat, either. Unbeknownst to him, I am getting the police involved, because I now have solid evidence that this man has a sick obsession with my child. This is the bad news, and I'll forewarn you that if you're easily triggered, please don't read any further, or at least skip this and the next two paragraphs. I want to thank you all for confirming my suspicions in the first post, because I found something heinous. I mentioned that I planned to set up a camera in Roman's room. I asked for his permission first, and he said he didn't care, since we're barely in the house anymore. The camera I chose is motion-sensitive and links the footage to my iPhone, so I can watch it anywhere. The camera was set up on Sunday night as soon as I received the package, and I hid it above the doorframe so that it overlooked the entire room. You can't see it unless you use a ladder. I didn't get anything for a couple days, I was randomly notified of movement in the room, but saw nothing when I looked at the footage. But on Wednesday evening, at around 6, David came into my son's room, stood there for a moment, and then left, no longer than a minute. An hour-ish later, he returned and started going through his drawers. He picked up a specific garment and left within less than two minutes. I wanted to throw up. I didn't sleep that entire night at the motel. The following day, I had someone cover my shift, which gave me the opportunity to do a deep search of David's room while he was at work and my son was at school. I found the article of clothing inside of his pillowcase, on top of the pillow, right where he would lay his head to rest at night. I was so sick to my stomach that it took me almost two hours to confiscate that article of clothing and check it for evidence. I won't elaborate, but you can infer what I mean. I was nauseated the entire time. All I could do was put on gloves, throw it into a Ziploc bag, and shove it into my closet. I didn't want to look at it or even think about it. I still don't. That answers the question of why David was so insistent on doing my kid's laundry. Who knows how long this has been going on? I've been ruminating on the next steps to take. Besides my main priority, going to the police, my other priority is telling my sister Sarah. We are obviously not on the best terms right now. She found out that I confronted her boyfriend last week, and she is livid. How dare I accuse him of grooming my son? Apparently, he's not the same man he was after we left and returned to his old habits. He was back to going to bars with his friends every evening. His drinking got worse. He had stopped coming home early from work and dragged himself through the door at almost midnight, if he even bothered coming home, that is. And he was no longer affectionate toward her. Apparently, it's my fault he's depressed again. If those aren't red flags, I don't know what is. I can't tell if she is in denial, or if she can't actually see them. But what she's most concerned about is that David hasn't been home since Thursday. He went to work, came home briefly, then left again without telling her when he'd be back. In my head, that makes sense, he knows that either she or I took the garment that was inside of his pillowcase, and now he's afraid to come home. It confirms all of my suspicions. I will tell my sister everything, though, probably tonight or tomorrow. I have no idea how to go about it, and I guess I'm nervous about her reaction. She's still convinced that I'm having a manic episode. I was diagnosed with bipolar 1 many years ago, and I take medication to manage it. If I go off of my meds, my mania will progressively get worse until I spiral into psychosis. So her concerns are valid, I put her through a lot back when I wasn't stable, but that's not the current case for me right now. 
I have tangible proof and video proof of her boyfriend being a creep. I can bring up the camera footage, but then I have the issue of not getting either of their consent to put a camera in their house, and I don't know how well that would go over with her, even if it was for a good reason. I just know that if I were in her shoes, I would be grateful that my boyfriend, potential fiancé, was outed as a predator before I got engaged to him. She's pretty much past the age of having children, but has plans to adopt in the distant future, so I have to tell her, somehow. My son and I have been back in the house since Friday night. My sister still isn't kicking me out, but she doesn't want me here anymore. She's made that very clear. The only reason why I haven't packed our things and left is because, again, David is gone. He won't tell anyone his whereabouts and has turned off his location on his phone, according to my sister. She thinks he might be crashing on a friend's couch, something he's done multiple times in the past. I think he knows I'm onto him. But his absence means that I can stay at the house for now. I'm still watching my kid like a hawk and staying hypervigilant. Still sleeping in his room, taking him to work with me, etc. I can live with the hostility from my sister as long as he is safe, especially since we won't be here for much longer. Which leads me to the good news. I got approved for public housing. I won't share too many details, but I will share the most important one, we'll get to move in in a little over three weeks. There are a lot of logistics that I need to work out, the school bus system, a mode of transportation to work, etc., but I'm glad that something is working out in my favor after this week of hell. The constant vigilance is exhausting, and I can't wait to be in a safer environment. I guess all I really have left to say is that I'm not sure how to go about providing the evidence I have to the police. When I give them what I have, they'll start some kind of investigation, right? I'm just nervous that I could get into trouble for the camera. And the messaging, that counts as harassment, right? Do I tell my sister everything before I go to the police? Any advice you can give is welcome, because I've never been in a situation like this before, and I don't want to mess it up. Just because I am leaving does not mean that I'm letting David get away with what he's done. Thank you all for your unwavering support. I'm having a hard time right now, but I'll update as soon as I can. Thank you for listening. Edit. Thank you for the overwhelming advice. I put the clothing into a paper bag, I had no idea how plastic could affect it. I will make copies of the texts and the camera footage. I will not be telling my sister anything for the time being, and I am going to the police tomorrow. I am looking into getting a lawyer as well. Roman school has already been informed that I am the only guardian allowed to pick him up. He will be staying with a friend tomorrow night, and once I save a little money I will move us back to the motel. Update 4 Hi all, this is my fourth update. It's a bit weird to be sharing the personal details of my life to thousands of people online, but I feel like I owe it to you all and it helps me keep track of everything, so I don't mind. Not to mention how helpful your advice has been, as I've never encountered a situation like this and I was terrified that I'd make the wrong move and mess everything up. So thank you all so much for being so kind and helpful. There's a lot I have to talk about, I did go to the police, and an arrest will most likely be made in the near future. Before I get into that, I think I will start with the escalation in David's behavior and his whereabouts, and then circle back to what happened with the police. Hopefully, the timeline still makes sense. TLDR at the bottom. In my last update, I left off with David's disappearance after I found out what he did with my son's clothing and confiscated it. It turns out that David was not on the run, nor missing, nor crashing on a friend's couch. He holed up at his parents' house, and is still currently there. My sister informed me that due to my accusations of him grooming my son, David had a mental health crisis, she hopes I'm happy with myself, and she feels the need to stay with him for support. So, in other words, he's hiding at his parents' house, because either the guilt is getting to him, or he's scared. Or both. His entire family is infuriated with me. Whatever story he's feeding them is making me look insane in their eyes. Not once did they ask me for my side of the story. After I went to the police, my sister made the decision to kick me out of her home. I saw it coming a mile away, so I'm not too upset by it, 
I just wish she didn't feel such fierce loyalty to him and his family. I don't even know how to explain to my kid that his aunt doesn't support him. She does know I was approved for housing and that I have no other place for our belongings at the moment, so she at least has the decency to let us keep our stuff there until we can fully move out. I guess that counts for something. Not much else to say about that, I've just been trying to keep my distance. David's behavior, though, got so much worse during this mental health crisis. The harassment escalated to stalking, under the guise of wanting to clear the air. He showed up to Roman's baseball game that was held at a different school to try and speak with him. That means he found his schedule, the exact time he was playing, and the address of that school. Found the motel we'd been staying at, we had to move to a different one after this incident. Created three other Instagram profiles to message him about how this is all a misunderstanding, how much he misses him, etc. Some of these messages were awful. Things like, don't let other people make decisions for you, and you're old enough to decide who should be in your life and who shouldn't. Paragraphs and paragraphs of him pouring his heart out to my son and begging him not to tell me that he's been reaching out. This harassment has left my son completely disillusioned. After screenshotting everything, I asked him not to read the messages anymore and to just delete them. At that point, I wanted to take his phone away, but I knew he'd resent me for that. Maybe I made the wrong decision, maybe I didn't. I don't know. The day David found our motel was one of the most traumatic moments of my life. I don't know how he found us. My sister knows I've been staying at a motel, but I never told her which one. On that day, it was about 9 p.m., and I needed to go to the corner store to grab something. My son was taking a shower and getting ready for bed, as he had school the next day. The corner store was a minute's walk away. The room we were staying in was visible from the windows of the store. I'd made this quick trip countless times. In the moment, I didn't feel unsafe leaving my kid behind, but hindsight is always 20 20s. I already feel stupid, no need to tell me. David had parked at the lot across the street, and I didn't see his car. He waited until I was almost at the store and my back was fully turned to go for our motel room door. It was obviously locked, so he started knocking, but by then I had already heard him and was running in his direction. I nearly blacked out from the fear and adrenaline, and it's hard to remember much. I recall that he didn't seem angry, he just had this miserable, panicked look in his eyes. He really did look like someone who was going through a mental health crisis. I told him I was calling the police and that he needed to leave. He said that he was entitled to a conversation with me, but he ran off once he saw me dialing 911. To me, his reasoning is bullshit. He keeps saying that he wants a conversation and to clear the air with me, but if that were true, then why didn't he approach me? He knew I wasn't in the room. Why did he essentially try to break in, where he knew my son was alone? I of course documented this incident with the police, which I will get into right now. On Monday, March 27, the day after my last update and days before the aforementioned events occurred, I went to the police for the first time. The police officer I spoke with sat me down and gave me the opportunity to talk about everything, how David was very close with Roman, what I caught him doing with his clothes, the messages, etc. Thank God for these posts, because I found myself referring back to them. Memory can be unreliable. I presented the evidence that I had as well, I showed the video footage and gave her the article of clothing I confiscated, as well as the text messages and Instagram and TikTok messages. She then told me she would contact the district attorney, which she did soon after. I was shocked by how fast the process was moving, and she told me that since it involves the potential sexual abuse of a minor, they don't want to waste any time. I was interviewed again by a detective, and a couple days later, they called David in for an interview. By then, the stalking had begun. During my second interview, I showed him the new messages David sent, and told him about how David showed up to the school and the motel. I don't know what they asked David during his interview, but I can imagine that he denied everything and spun up a web of lies to try and make me look crazy. I'm not really concerned about him, though. With all of the evidence I have, David should be very, very nervous. A detective interviewed my son as well. 
This is what worried me the most, and I insisted that if they didn't have to do it, I'd rather they didn't question him at all. But they said it would help build a stronger case, and I trust them. I was told I had to be there during his interview, since he is a minor. Roman only knows about the stalking and harassment, but he has no idea about what David did with his clothes, and I want to keep it that way for as long as I can. I personally asked the detective not to bring it up. I'd just like to shield him from it all. They asked my son about the messages and the stalking, as well as their relationship. When asked about any physical contact they had, Roman brought something up that he didn't initially tell me about. He said there was one instance when he and David were in the living room watching a show called Stranger Things. David randomly placed his hand on my son's chest, left it there for a moment, then said, I'm glad you're alive. I don't really know what to make of that, but combined with everything else he's done, it's very disturbing. I asked my son about it afterward, and he said that he didn't tell me because it didn't make him feel uncomfortable. As an isolated event, I guess it could seem like an innocent act to a 13-year-old, so I understand why he didn't bring it up, but I don't know. All I can do is take his word for it. In terms of the case, they are now requesting a warrant of arrest with the clerk of the court. If this is granted, then David will be arrested and charged with lewd and lascivious behavior, harassment, and stalking. He could end up getting up to five years in prison, maybe even more since a minor is involved. So that's where I'm at right now, waiting for the clerk's decision. The waiting game is stressful, but I'm trying to focus on the positives as much as I can. It's nice to see how fast the police and detectives are working and how serious they are taking my case. All I can do is trust that the outcome will be in my favor. After the interviews, all of David's harassment stopped. Good thing, too, stalking and harassment of a minor is a felony, and I'm sure knowing that the police are onto him scared him. I'm not naive enough to feel safe, though. I filed a petition for a protective order after the motel incident. I've been feeling paranoid, not a good feeling for someone who's bipolar, and having a lot of anxiety lately. Always looking over my shoulder, flinching when I see a stranger who looks like him, etc. I'm entitled to a conversation with you, he said when he tried to break into my motel room, but I don't believe him. I think David believes he's entitled to unrestrained access to my child due to their prior relationship. The entitlement is what scares me the most, that someone can just take something because they feel like it belongs to them. I'm scared to go anywhere with my kid. Anytime he goes to school, I fear that it will be the last time I see him. It hasn't sunk in yet that my situation has developed into this. It's been difficult for me to wrap my head around where David's sudden attachment stemmed from. I was under the impression that predators are in general weird around children, but he never acted this way around other children, only mine. When he started dating my sister, she told me that David didn't want kids, and she was trying to convince him to change his mind. That's why she was so happy to see him and my son bond. Someone previously commented that in David's mind, he might believe that there's a legitimate romantic connection between him and my son. I don't know if there's any validity to that, and the idea of looking into it makes me nauseous. I'd rather not speculate and just pray that he gets arrested soon. The biggest drawback is that all of this has significantly disturbed our quality of life. I know that my kid is putting on a brave face, but he's not doing well. It's getting to him, and I knew it would, but actually seeing this siphon his happiness away is gut-wrenching. He's still doing fine at school, still eagerly partaking in sports and spending time with his friends, but every once in a while, he'll do the thousand-yard stare, his eyes bereft of any sort of awareness, dissociation, maybe? He used to eat a ton, but he hasn't been finishing his food lately. He constantly says he doesn't feel well. I can't afford therapy right now, but I spoke with his school counselor, and they want to start weekly meetings with him to check in, which my son was not thrilled about, as he does not want to bring any of this up at school. He is very open with me about his feelings, and we do talk about everything that's been going on, but there's only so much I can do. He needs a professional. I'm not doing well either. I am exhausted. I've never felt so overwhelmed in my entire life. My mental health is on a rapid decline. I'm not eating or sleeping normally. I can barely get through a shift at work without breaking down. 
even my intrusive thoughts have been alarming and distressing. You don't think you're capable of these things until you're in this situation. There really is no going back once you find out something like that. I don't have a lot of people to talk to about this. I think I need help. Hopefully my next update is more positive. Thank you for listening. That's where the story ends. Please consider subscribing to keep up to date on this post and other daily Reddit content.